and welcome to another episode of Sassy Talks. I'm your host, Savannah, and on today's show, we are going to be speaking with Professor Lisa Bortolotti. She's a professor of philosophy at Birmingham University, and she's also a member of the Institute of Mental Health. And she's going to be talking to us about the curious nature of irrational beliefs and how they have an impact on our mental health. Now there's a wide range of irrational beliefs from delusion to even optimism and apparently we all have them. So how can we use them to our best advantage? Very welcome to the show Lisa, thank you so much for being on Sassy Talks today. Thank you for having me. What are irrational beliefs in general and for the average Joe? Yes, of course. So. Rationality and irrationality are really big concepts and we use them in different ways, which sometimes can be really confusing. Um, but when we're thinking about our beliefs, which are just representations of reality, how we see things, how we see ourselves, how we see the world in which we live and operate, um, then I think the crucial notion of rationality um, that we have in mind when we say, oh, that belief is irrational or you shouldn't think irrationally has to do with evidence. So what is special about beliefs, what makes them different from other mental states that we might have, such as emotions or imaginings, is that beliefs are supposed to be based on evidence. When that doesn't happen, when I uh, assert something with great conviction, but then, you know, the content of my belief is not supported by any evidence, um, then the belief is irrational. Another aspect of the relationship between the belief and the evidence is that even after I have adopted the belief, I may be very resistant to changing my belief if new evidence comes along. This is very, this is very black and white. I think it's sunny outside. It is sunny outside. Let's go for a picnic. It starts raining. I still think it's sunny outside. So this is, this is clearly bordering on delusion, isn't it? Yeah, although I guess it becomes more understandable that we may do this kind of thing. Um, when you think that, you know, we have a lot of a lot of emotions and desires as well. We are not like machines, you know, we're not just recording reality as it is. We actually have a lot of investment in the things that we want to do or we want to achieve. So sometimes it's actually painful to accept something that doesn't fit with how we want things to be. Now, the case of the weather is not that significant. Um, but if you are thinking about another example, so suppose that I really believe that I'm an excellent public speaker. And that is part of my conception of myself, is how I see myself. I value myself for, um, for this capacity that I think I have. But suppose that actually I'm terrible, right? And my students don't understand what I say when I lecture to them, that people give me negative feedback and still I do not take it on because I've got this conviction that I'm an excellent speaker. Now, you may say, you know, couldn't you just listen to the feedback you're receiving? Yes, I could. But that would be quite painful for me because I would have to revise my whole conception of myself in a negative way. I would have to think, you know, that there is one thing that I cannot do well, that I'm not I'm a failure at that particular thing that I thought was important for me. But isn't it down to opinion at the end of the day with a lot of these things? Certainly people will have different representations of reality. So if you take, you know, two people with different backgrounds, uh, maybe different uh, levels of education, different ideologies, and you put them in the same situation, they might come up with reports of what is happening that are quite different. You know, that, that's inevitable, I think. Again, you know, we're not objective machines. We come with, with a baggage, right? We, we, we have been raised in a certain way. We've got certain assumptions. Um, and so that is inevitable. At the same time, I think that the notion of rationality when it applies to belief is this idea that you cannot just believe whatever you like, right? That to some extent, if something is a belief, 
is supposed to capture something objective or at least something that other people can share with you. It's not just something that belongs to you and you can do whatever you like with it. So the idea that I'm not even moved by the fact that I receive negative feedback, that I dismiss it or I ignore it, suggests irrationality. I mean, it might be that the people who give me negative feedback are wrong and I'm right in thinking that I'm an excellent speaker. But the fact that I'm not even prepared to critically examine my belief and to kind of take on board the negative feedback is an alarm, right? Because it means that I'm so confident in what I believe that I'm not actually open-minded to think about alternative ways of thinking. And I'm not even open to the possibility that I could improve something about my performance. The belief is supposed to be really something about the intersubjective experience. So everybody, you know, can actually be able to, should be able to share the belief. Okay. So why, why is this important? So you've got, let's say, an example who isn't willing to hear the the thoughts if you like or the perceptions the beliefs of others around them why is this important yeah so it's important for many reasons but i think the central one is that um we do have an interest in representing reality as it is it is a good thing for us because it enables us to explain things that we may be interested in but also to predict the future, right? And to predict how other people will behave. So to coordinate with other people in our lives. Um, If we all have different beliefs about things, we're not going to uh, be able to do anything together. Teamwork becomes really difficult. Uh, Simple understanding of what other people may be thinking or feeling becomes very difficult. So I think we have an interest as a species in true beliefs, in beliefs that reflect reality. At the same time, we're not built with a foolproof uh, way of detecting truth, right? Um, and, and so our knowledge may be limited. The information that we receive from the world may be biased, may be partial. We need other people as well. We need the capacity to assess what we are thinking and to ask the question, is this actually true? I mean, what is my reason to think that this is the case? Um, So although we have an interest in truth, truth is something quite difficult to achieve. And making sure that our beliefs receive evidence, are supported by evidence, is one way to making sure that are closer to the truth. Um, Believing that it's important for us to coordinate with other people and believing that we may not be infallible, we may not be experts in everything, is also very important. And I think recent events have really shown that. for, for a few months, everybody was an expert in epidemiology or vaccination. Everybody had an opinion. It's really important, especially when there are things that are truly significant in our lives and have a huge impact, that we recognize that we can achieve a lot, we can learn a lot, but we also have to have the humility to say there is someone who may know better, who may have studied more, who may have thought about this, from a different angle, and I need to understand their perspective. I don't necessarily need to kind of throw my uh, arms in the air and say they are right and I'm wrong, but I need to engage, to be prepared to be proven wrong. So we all have irrational beliefs then, is this correct? We tend to think traditionally that irrational beliefs are weird, only a few people have them, maybe they're associated with poor mental health, Um, But that's actually very simplistic and and actually false, you know. Um, So very often people who are diagnosed with psychiatric disorders or mental conditions of some sort have a better capacity to get to the truth than people who don't because uh, their minds work differently. And in some situations, actually, they have uh, less, fewer biases than than, than the rest of us. So we really need to detach uh, irrationality from poor mental health. It's not true that only people who, you know, in the past we might have called mad or crazy are irrational and the rest of us are perfectly rational. Once we get that idea um, in, in, in uh, circulation, we also have to recognize that um, all of us have little um, gaps in our rationality. Uh, they may be different, but sometimes they're quite um, similar. So most people, the great majority of people, have optimistic beliefs about themselves. 
as we were discussing the example uh, earlier of me believing that I'm an excellent public speaker, most of us actually have something that psychologists call the illusion of superiority. It's a tendency that we have to see ourselves as better than average in a number of domains. That could be attractiveness, could be intelligence, could be specific skills like driving or academic performance. And we, in general, if we do not suffer from depression or depressive symptoms, we all have the illusion of superiority. So that is a form of irrationality that is extremely widespread. You, we can find it everywhere. Another one that you may find uh, almost everywhere is prejudice. So those kind of beliefs that we acquire for not very good reasons, not really well supported by evidence, and we don't give them up. For instance, an association between women and uh, emotionality, you know, the idea that women cannot be good scientists or cannot be logicians because they are driven only by their, their emotions. That is a prejudice that has kind of uh, permeated uh, Western uh, culture until very recently. But it's the kind of thing that, you know, has been uncritically accepted and it's very difficult to give up once, you know, you have internalized it. Um, and, and we find that prejudice is really there and it's, 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 it's a, something quite, quite difficult to, uh, to remove. This is, a, this is a, a very, very good point here around prejudices. Now, these are present for numerous reasons. Is there an impact on mental health and is there a need to adjust thinking around these irrational beliefs? I mean, what, where, where is your research with this? Because irrationality has these very negative connotations, I think the traditional approach to irrationality is that if you identify it, then you need to remove it. And, and that's definitely, I think, the right approach in most circumstances. At the same time, one thing that I've noticed is that um, there are some irrational beliefs that are very useful to us. So they play a function. They are still irrational. They're still not based on evidence or not revised in the face of evidence. They may still take us away from an accurate representation of reality, but they have a good, for instance, psychological function sometimes. They make us feel better about ourselves. For instance, if I believe uh, mistakenly that I'm a really good public speaker, I may be uh, much more confident when I have public speaking arrangements. And uh, as a result, maybe my performance is actually better than um, it could have been if I were doubting myself too much. So sometimes some irrational beliefs support our motivation and um, improve the way in which we perform in our workplace or, or also in other, in other contexts. So some people have observed that in Western societies, um, nowadays the divorce rate is something very close to 50%. However, if you ask people who are newly married what their chances of getting a divorce is, they will say something like 1%. Um, so there is a huge discrepancy between you know, the reality of things and how people feel about their relationships. And one thing that has been <laughs> noted by psychologists, for instance, is that even divorce lawyers, who should have a lot of experience in the reality of the situation, tend to be overly optimistic about the prospect of their own relationships, which means that even knowledge that you acquire about reality doesn't really protect you <laughs> from this kind of overly hopeful attitude that you might have. And again, the hopeful attitude may be good for you and for your, your uh, relationship, because when a crisis strikes, you may think, no, my relationship is strong and I can do something to improve this. So you cope with it in a different way. Maybe you're more resilient um, you cope more effectively, um, but ultimately, you know, your estimate doesn't take into account the fact that, you know, divorce happens to the best of people. So it might happen to you too. So is there, a, is there perhaps a good versus bad level of optimism? Because, I mean, there's something to be said about positive mental attitude and being able to achieve things through having the right mindset and, and, and actioning things through. So is there a good versus bad? I mean, my uh, way of thinking about it after reading uh, a lot of the literature and seeing the similarities and differences is that it has to do with denial. So optimism is bad 
when it leads you to deny the problem, to deny the crisis, to think that there is no threat. Why is it bad? Because if you deny that there is a problem in your relationship, in your health, uh, in your career, you are not prepared to face what is coming because uh, there will be crisis, there will be threats. Um, no life is completely smooth. And if you don't even think about the possibility that there will be a threat, your mood is better because you're more relaxed and, and you're so, uh, um, psychologists have also noted you're more sociable, people like you better because you're kind of carefree and you're not worried all the time. At the same time, you know, when the crisis strikes, you are really in a weak position because you don't know what to do. Uh, there is this huge disappointment that you're not prepared to face. The other optimism, which I think is the beneficial one, is when you accept the possibility of the problem, the threat, the crisis. You know it's coming, but uh, you don't let the crisis or the problem define you and beat you, right? So what you are thinking is, I'm good enough to face this. I have the capacities in myself, think about the illusion of superiority there or the illusion of control, to deal with this. So it's not a denial, it's rather an overestimation of your capacity to deal with the problem. And the overestimation is initially irrational in the sense that you don't have the evidence that you're actually so good at dealing with the threat uh, when you start off. But the fact that you are optimistic about yourself and about the outcomes makes you act in such a way that your prospects to actually overcome the threat become better. So that's the self-fulfilling prophecy. I can, you know, I believe that I can do it. And actually, because I believe that I can do it, I act in such a way that I make it more likely to happen. Um, so that's the good optimism. It's still irrational in some way, because at the beginning, I still have a kind of an overly positive view of myself. But it's not like um, sitting there. <laughs> it's doing something to me. It's changing the way I, I act. It's changing the way I behave. Um, and so the bad type of optimism, the denial, leads you to take risks. If you don't think you will get lung cancer, you will not stop smoking, right? Because you think, oh, it's not my problem. It's not going to happen. I'm not going to change my behavior. But the good type of optimism tells you, you know, you may get lung cancer. What can you do about it? Oh, maybe I should smoke fewer cigarettes a day, right? And so that's the kind of thing that I'm thinking now. So what would be the ways in which we can take our rational beliefs and use them to our best advantage? So if we think of irrational beliefs as beliefs that are not well supported by evidence or um, beliefs that we do not revise when we get uh, evidence against them, uh, they are certainly very common. So we all have them in different areas of, of our lives and we're all vulnerable to, to them. Um, it's always better to have an accurate representation of reality because that leads us to explain and predict things better and also coordinate better with other people. But we cannot avoid, as human beings, rather than angels or perfect computers, we cannot avoid irrational beliefs. So given that we have them, what should we do with them? I guess the key is to be able to distinguish the really bad irrational beliefs that we should eliminate as, as fast as we can and the irrational beliefs that are useful for us. Um, and one example I gave um, of a, an irrational belief that is useful is a belief that I'm actually a bit better than I am um, and I can control my life a little bit more than I uh, can actually do that. Why? Because that kind of attitude will help me face difficulties in a more positive way and cope more effectively with setbacks. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Lisa. I really appreciate that. Is there any last message you want to give to our audience and our viewers? The first step to reduce the irrationality that we all have is to be aware that, you know, we are limited in the way we acquire information, in the way we share information. Um, and, and to recognize that, you know, there is this limitation is actually a strength because it enables us to identify the weaknesses in our model of the world and to improve. So I think the most important thing for individuals, but also for society, like for institutions, is to recognize that we might not have all the answers, to have this kind of open-minded and humble way of approaching things, because that will also um, get us farther. You know, that we will be able to embrace 
truth that comes from places that we wouldn't have expected. Um, and that will uh, improve our outlook on the world and reduce the amount of irrational belief that we have. I like it. I like it. Lisa, thank you so much for these insights. I mean, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? I'm, I'm very pro the irrational beliefs that helps drive us forward to achieving our goals. And, and I mean, you take, for example, an entrepreneur who wants to start a business. They don't know how they're going to achieve uh, their, their goals and their dreams. But if they don't have a positive mental attitude, how do they even get started? So I think there's definitely yeah. pros to uh, potentially irrational beliefs in this sense but being aware of what the irrational ones might be and how they may be detrimental to our progress is very very key so here's to being more aware of what we're doing and what we're thinking Lisa thank you so much for being on Sassy Talk